watching Shalom TV, celebrating Jewish culture. Funding for Shalom TV has been provided by the following. And by viewers like you. Hi, I'm Rabbi Mordechai Becher. Welcome to Dimensions of the Duff on Shalom TV, uh, in which we look at a section of the Mishnah, or the Talmud rather, um, different aspects of the Talmud every week. Uh, no continuity is necessary, although it's a great idea, uh, but uh, each class stands by itself, and um, we uh, investigate different topics, which I choose more or less at random, from uh, all over the Talmud. Uh, so today we are looking at Ethics of the Fathers, uh, which actually is a section of the Talmud, it's a Mishnah, but it has no Gemara, there is no um, commentary on it from the Babylonian or the Jerusalem Talmud. Uh, but the Mishnah itself is the backbone of the entire Talmud. The Mishnah is the early text, which dates back to 170 to 200 of the Common Era, 200, about less than 2,000 years ago, written in the north of Israel, in the Galilee region, by Judah the Prince. Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi, descendant of King David, a leader of the Jewish people, and also a fabulously wealthy businessman and a great scholar and a master of the Hebrew language. So he was basically the ideal guy to write the Mishnah. He also happened to be a close friend of the Roman governor. Um, so he had, uh, he had really had everything. He had political connections. He was brilliant. He was wealthy. He was articulate. Um, and uh, he was a great scholar, and also he had a totally unblemished, pure reputation ethically. In fact, his nickname, people used to call him Rabbeinu HaKadosh, which means our holy rabbi. So uh, he wrote uh, one of the sections of the Mishnah, is known as Pirkei Avot, Ethics of the Fathers, and what I'd like to look at is just the first Mishnah, first one, uh, Mishnah of Ethics of the Fathers, just a little sampler of it, a little taste of it. We're not going to go through the whole thing. That's not our purpose here. A little sampler from different sections of the Talmud. I don't think we've uh, done eth anything from Ethics of the Fathers before in our, in our uh, series. So I'd like to do that today. So um, if you have a look at the screen, I have here the text of that first Mishnah in Hebrew and in English. Uh, the Mishnah uh, was written in Hebrew. Uh, the Talmud, the Gemara, which is the commentary of the Mishnah written a couple of few hundred years later in Babylon, and Israel was written in Aramaic. Aramaic is a very similar language to Hebrew. It was the language of the Jews, the lingua franca of most Jews at that time. We spoke Aramaic. Today, uh, Jews still use Aramaic in the study of the Talmud, uh, in our, some of our prayers. And there are pockets of communities. Uh, there are some Jews from different parts of the world, Yemen and Syria, who still speak Aramaic. And I understand there are also some uh, non-Jews who speak Aramaic uh, in uh, Syria and I think in Iraq. Anyway, uh, this is in Hebrew. It's fairly easy Hebrew. And it's the first Mishnah in Ethics of the Fathers. So um, Mishnah starts the following way. Moshe kibel Torah Messinai. Moses received the Torah from Sinai. Umasara li Yoshua. He gave it over to Joshua. Joshua, of course, was his student and his successor, who was the leader of the Jewish people. Yeshua Lezakanim, Joshua gave it over, the Torah over, to the elders. Lezakanim and Nevi'im, the Nevi'im gave it over to the prophets. The elders, sorry, gave it over to the prophets, Nevi'im. Nevi'im and the prophets, Mesarua, gave it over to Ansheik Neset Hagdalah, to the men of the great assembly. They said three things. Be deliberate in judgment. Ha'amidu Tamidu Harbe, set up many students, Vasus Siag la Torah, and make a fence around the Torah. So, the first thing we have to understand is that the nature of ethics of the fathers, this particular section of the Mishnah, primarily deals with ethical and moral instructions. It deals with character traits, personality, and ethics. 
it is very different from the rest of it. The rest of the Mishnah is mainly law, legal stuff, right? Uh, prohibitions, obligations, uh, financial law, torts, damages, ritual law, prayers, etc. Law. This is an unusual section of the Mishnah. It deals with things which are not really law, but they're much more ethics. In fact, the Talmud says, one who wants to be pious should study this tractate, this section. Uh, it, there's three opinions, actually. One says, if you want to be pious, you should really study Nazikin. Nazikin deals with financial laws, business ethics, um, and uh, damage to other people, etc. He says, if you want to be pious, that's what you should study. The other says, if you want to be pious, you should study the laws of blessings and prayer. And the third opinion is, if you want to be pious, you should study ethics of the fathers. And uh, of course, our commentaries point out, the Maharal and the Ramchal and others point out that it's not really an argument. Each one is just emphasizing a different thing. But basically, one says, if you want to be pious, you want to be a good person, the main focus should be in your relationship with other people. Honesty, being straight, business ethics, etc. That is your main focus. You want to be pious, right? That involves primarily your relationship with other people, honesty, integrity, etc. The second view says you should you want to be pious, you cannot ignore your relationship with God. And hence prayer and blessings is a major focus of that, your relationship with the Creator. Right? The fact you haven't hurt anyone is wonderful, but if you haven't connected with God, not good. You've got to be, you want to be pious, you've got to connect with God. And the other opinion is, if you want to be pious, you have to fulfill the words of Ethics of the Fathers, this section of the Mishnah, which we're just uh, doing one, one section of now. Because Ethics of the Fathers contains the kernels and the essence of good personality traits, of good behavior, of what we call in Hebrew derech eretz, which means the way of the land, meaning uh, in Yiddish, there's a beautiful term in Yiddish, menschlichkeit, which means being a mensch, being a good person. Being a person. Basic, in English, I think would probably translate menschlichkeit as basic human decency. So um, that is this Mishnah. Now, what's interesting is that it starts in a very unusual way. Uh, nowhere else in the entire Mishnah does it start with the uh, genealogy, so to speak, of the, of the oral law. It was, uh, the, the law was transmitted through generation to generation, eventually written down by Judah the Prince. But this is the only section where he gives us the uh, transmission process. And if you were writing it, if I was writing it, where would you write the transmission of the oral law? I was, where in the Mishnah would we put this? And I mean, I think most people would probably say, well, you should put it at the beginning. The very first Mishnah in the whole of the Talmud, that's where it should be. This should work. That's where you should write it. You should write, Moses received the Torah from Sinai, gave it to Joshua, Joshua to the elders, the elders of the prophets, prophets of men of the great assembly, etc., etc. Why here? Why is it that in this particular section of the Mishnah is the place that Judah the prince chose to give us the hierarchy, the ge I'm not exactly sure of the term for this, the hierarchy, the genealogy, the transmission of the, of the provenance of the oral tradition. Why here? And there's a few answers to it. But one answer is very important. One answer is this. Every other section of the Mishnah always deals with a specific mitzvah commandment, a specific verse of the Torah, a specific prohibition. For example, and we've studied these things before. Tractate Sukkah, Sukkah deals with the mitzvah, the, co the obligations in the Torah surrounding the festival of Sukkot. Tractate Shabbat, Sabbath, deals with the laws surrounding the observance of the Sabbath, something in the Torah. Tractate Bova Kama, Bova Metzia, for example, deals with the laws surrounding um, the returning of lost property um, and other related laws. So these are all mitzvot which are in the Torah explicitly. So therefore, virtually every tractate, with this exception, deals with a specific mitzvah, specific prohibition, specific laws, or specific verses in the Torah. The one tractate that doesn't is this, Ethics of the Fathers. So here especially, Reb Judah the Prince, the author, felt a need to give you the genealogy of this mission to tell you, don't worry, even though it doesn't deal with a specific commandment, even though it does not deal with a specific law, even though it does not deal with a specific section of the Torah, it nevertheless is of equal importance. And its provenance also goes back to Sinai. So the person should know that ethical, 
purity, common human decency, derech eretz, piety in the, my relationship with other people and myself, etc. That's also directly goes back to Moses at Sinai is of equal importance. And therefore, here it's necessary to put it. You see, you don't have to put this before the tractate of Sukkah because that deals with verses in the Torah itself. You just look at the Bible. Here are the verses in the Bible. Here's the Mishnah that explains it. Here's the Gemara that explains the Mishnah. But here, it's not based on specific verses. It's not based on specific commandments. We need to reinforce the provenance of it. That's one idea. A second idea, mentioned by one of the commentaries, Rabbeinu Yonah of Girondi in Italy. Rabbeinu Yonah, uh, 12th century, I think he was. So Rabbeinu Yonah says this. He says that, you see, many, many cultures produce books of ethics. The Greeks... Aristotle and Plato and, and others produced books of ethics. The ancient Egyptians, many cultures, and today we have pop psychology, self-help section of the bookstore, huge section. So there's a lot of books dealing with ethical behavior. What is to distinguish ethics of the fathers from all other books dealing with this type of behavior? Books of advice, etc. And the answer is this first Mishnah. While many other cultures have produced books of ethics, while many people have produced books of ethics, this is unique in that it is not produced by people. It is something which comes down by tradition from Moses at Sinai. So that all the, everything contained in ethics of the fathers, we are to understand it not merely as pop psychology, not merely as rabbinic advice, not merely as something from the self-help section, right? but rather we have to understand it as as coming down from the Torah, from Sinai, ultimately from the Creator, from God. So therefore we have to deal with it with a tremendous, much greater seriousness and much greater um, uh, gravity when we look at it. A third reason, also very important, um, and this I heard from Rabbi Isaac Bernstein, um, who's a famous rabbi from Dublin, passed away at a young age, but brilliant, brilliant scholar. And uh, his understanding is this, that since this entire section deals with ethics, placing the chain of transmission of, that's the word, chain of transmission of the oral law of the Torah, at the beginning is a way of telling us that, you know what, in order to be a scholar, a Torah scholar, in order to be part of the chain of transmission, it is not sufficient to be brilliant. It's not sufficient to be smart. You've got to also be ethical. A prime qualification to be a leader of the Jewish people, a prime qualification that we look for, quality we look for in being in the Sanhedrin, the Jewish court, in being a transmitter of the tradition is not just having a high IQ, but is actually being an ethical and good person, fulfilling the words of Perkei Avot. That's why it's here. It's telling us that all the people in the chain of transmission were people of great moral and ethical stature, not merely geniuses. Um, Moses when he is praised in the Torah, when the Torah, when the Bible describes how great Moses was, it does not say anything about his IQ, although I'm sure he was brilliant. It doesn't say anything about his memory. I'm sure he had a fantastic photographic memory. It does not say anything about how sharp he was in processing information or how fast he was in understanding. It doesn't say that. It says one thing. He was the most humble of all people. Most humble of all people. When the Torah describes Joshua, who took over from Moses, It does not describe him as a brilliant scholar. It does not describe him as a great leader. It describes him as he was a na'ar and he was someone who never left the tent of Moses, meaning he was diligent. He served Moses. He had respect for Moses. He he acted as a child, even though he was 40, he's described as a teenager. Why? Because in that sense, he, he was acting as a humble disciple. So humility... And respect were, all, were his qualities. Again, does not talk about his brilliance, talks about his, res- his humility, talks about his respect. And that, that's why at the beginning of this mission, it starts with that chain of transmission. So those are three answers to that question. Just as another point, I should, I should, where is ethics of the fathers placed in the total? In other words, we, and I think I've done a class about this. I don't know if we have archives. Maybe you can find it there. But there are six sections of the Mishnah. The first, it deals with Agriculture, the laws of agriculture of the land of Israel, tithing and, and the sabbatical year and so on and so forth. The second deals with times, the calendar, the festivals, Sabbath. Third, it deals with marriage, divorce, adultery, incest, vows, promises, contracts, etc. Damages, business ethics, 
um, uh, business law, uh, torts, um, uh, property law, etc., etc. That was number four. Number five deals with the laws of the animal world, the sacrifices of the temple, the laws of kashrut, the dietary laws, etc. And number six deals with life, death, and purity and impurity. So if you were writing the mission, where would you put ethics at the far? Where would you put ethics? Where would you put decency? Where would you put it? Some would say, put it at the beginning. Others would say, I'd put, I don't know, but, but I'll tell you where Judah the Prince places it. Right in smack bang in the middle of Mazikin, of the section dealing with business law and with property law and with money. So some say that it's a hint to us, not a, it's a blatant hint, it's not, it's not subtle. It's a hint to us that if you really want to be ethically good, if you want to be a good person, you want to be pious, you want to be righteous, you want to be religious, then, uh, then look at this section of the Mishnah. Business ethics, honesty, etc. That's one possibility. Others say, Maimonides says, well, it's placed, interestingly enough, right after the tractate, the section that deals with the laws of the courts, the Sanhedrin, the Jewish court, and the reason it's here, he says, is the following. He says, because although it's true that every individual, every private person needs to be decent and needs to have ethics and, and, and good character, he says, but if, a, if an individual is unethical, if an individual has a lousy ca character, then his damage is limited to himself and his small circle of influence. He says, but if a leader of a generation, a judge in the court, a member of the government, a, a rabbi, a leader of the people, if he is corrupt in character, if he is not upright, then such a person damages not only himself, but the entire generation. So it's much more vital for a leader, for a judge, for a, for a member of the Sanhedrin to have ethical purity than for anyone else. Much more important, because his damage is much greater. And therefore, the Reb Judah the Prince decided, I'm going to put the issue of ethics right next to tractate of Sanhedrin as a lesson to teach us that lesson. Okay. That is as far as the, the positioning of it, and that is as far as the, uh, the first, the, the introduction to the Mishnah. I, one thing I did not mention is why is it called Avot? Which means chapter, literally it means chapters of the fathers. Ethics of the fathers is not an accurate translation. Pirke Avot is the accurate translation, and it means the chapters of the fathers. Why is it called of the fathers? What does that mean? Or the parents? if we wanted to be politically correct about it. Chapter of the parents, but it really means fathers. Why fathers? What does it mean? So one answer is that the, our, our, our fathers of the Jewish people are the people who transmitted the Torah throughout the generations. Those truly are our fathers. Now, yes, we have biological fathers, and yes, we have people who have done all types of wonderful things. But the ultimate parenting or fatherhood of the Jewish people is found in those who transmit the Torah because that is our, that, those are our values, that's our belief, that is our system of life, and therefore that is really the one who transmits life through the Jewish people, and therefore they are our fathers. A second idea is that it's the job of a parent is not only to provide the child with food and clothing and shelter and education. The prime job of the parent is to shape as much as possible to shape this child into an ethical personality. You want, we want to build a child who's got a good character. I should be much more concerned with my child's character than which college they get into. I should be much more concerned with my child's honesty than how much they got in their exam. I should be much more concerned with my child's personality than I am with how good they are at sports. That is the primary job of the parent, and that is what is being indicated here. So it's a tractate of the parents, because it's teaching us as parents, this is what we have to do. And if they are teaching us ethics, they're acting as parents as well, so to speak, in loco parentis, in place of parents. And a fourth reason, I think we're up to four, I don't remember, right? But a fourth reason is called avot is because all the stuff mentioned here is not the exhaustive list. Right, ideas mentioned here are avot, that means they're primary ideas and they're a secondary. That means they're fathers of ideas and, and use your brains and figure out what the children of these ideas are as well. In other words, there's more to it than what is written here. Okay, now let's look at the text of the Mishnah. I'll just, first of all, a who's who. Moses, of course, everyone's heard of Moses, received the Torah on Sinai from Sinai. 
He gave it to Joshua. Joshua was the leader of the Jewish people immediately following Moses. He was the one who was appointed by Moses as the leader. And that was the very first case of what we call smicha, rabbinic ordination. Moses places his hand on the head of Joshua and confers upon him authority. Joshua leads the battles to conquer the land of Israel and he divides up the land of Israel amongst the Jews and he rules the Jews for many years. Then we have afterwards Zikanim, elders. The elders here refers to a period of time there was something like a couple of hundred years we didn't have a king. We were ruled by elders, people who were great people, um, who some of them were prophets, some of them were just great scholars. Uh, some of them you've heard of, some of them you have not. I'm sure you've heard of some of these leaders of the Jewish people, Samson and Eli and Devorah. Uh, these were some of the leaders. And they transmitted the Torah to the Navi and the prophets. Of course, some of the most famous prophets, one of the earliest was Samuel the prophet. Uh, but the prophets were uh, included many, many people. Um, you had Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Isaiah, Yirmiyahu, Yechezkel, Yeshaya, all the great prophets. And they transmitted the Torah. They gave it over to the men of the great assembly. Who were the men of the great assembly? This was the end of the era of prophecy. It was approximately the beginning of the Second Temple era. Just to give you an idea, the Torah is given in 1313 BCE. That's 1,000... Uh, that's, sorry, that's approximately... Uh, 3,300 years ago. Um, Moses gives over the Torah to Joshua. That's 40 years later. Uh, Joshua takes over. He leads the Jews into Israel in 1270 BCE. Uh, the Jews are in Israel about until 400, uh, uh, 400 years later, in other words, 800 or so. And that's when we have our first kings, King Saul, King David, King Solomon. King David, King Solomon builds the first temple. That lasts for another 400 years. So the Jews have been in Israel now 800 years. Jerusalem has been the capital for approximately 400 years. And uh, then the temple is, uh, is around for that long. It is destroyed by the Babylonians who exiled the Jews to Babylon. At this time, we still have prophet. That's approximately the ex uh, to Babylon. We're talking about 2,500 years ago, approximately. The Jews come back to Israel with two prophets, Ezra and Nehemiah. So that means we still had prophets at the time. And at the time of the beginning of the Second Temple era, which, by the way, lasted for another 400 years till the Romans destroyed it, but the beginning of that era, 2,500 years ago, a group of great rabbis, and also some of them were prophets, Haggai, Zechariah, Zechariah, Malachi, were members of this group. 120 of these leaders of the Jews got together and they formed the Great Assembly. Knesset, which of course is the name for the modern uh, state of Israel's parliament, is based on this, 120 members. And these were the 120 leaders of the Jews. So they, the, the, the prophets, so to speak, gave the Torah over to them. So that's who we're talking about. Just a, a question. I hope maybe you've picked this up. If you look at the first four words of the Mishnah, which you've got on, this, on, the, on the screen there, it says, Moshe... Kibel Torah Messinai, which in the English translated accurately, Moses received Torah from Sinai. Now, you all know that Sinai is a mountain. Mount Sinai is where Moses received the Torah. So, what should it actually say in the Mishnah? Sorry? Right. right. The Mishnah should actually say, Moses received the Torah at Sinai. Moshe Kibel Torah be Sinai, which in Hebrew would mean Moses received the Torah at Sinai. It's a geographical location. Or it should say, Moshe Kibel Torah me Hashem. It should say, Moses received the Torah from God. So it's a strange way. You know, it should say, Moses received the Torah at Sinai, or Moses received the Torah from God. But to say, Moses received the Torah from Sinai is just not accurate. What's the meaning? I, I should tell you, there are probably about 30 different explanations for this. But I'm just going to give you a couple. One is, Moses, Sinai, Mount Sinai represents humility. It is the lowest mountain. Traditionally, we believe it's the lowest mountain in the mountain range there. Range there. The name Sinai comes from the word sne, which means bush. That's where Moses saw the burning bush. Um, and so, therefore, it indicates lowliness and humility. So, when we say Moses received the Torah from Sinai, what it means is this. Moses received the Torah from, because of, or due to the fact that he himself was Sinai. He was humble. One possibility. Another possibility is Moses received the Torah from the Sinai experience, meaning, yes, he got it from God, 
but it was a Sinai experience, meaning it was the entire, it was the fact that it wasn't just Moses and it wasn't just him at the mountain. It was this whole Sinai experience which the entire Jewish people right, heard the word of God, the words of God, what we call theophany, in which God speaks to an entire people, so he receives it from Sinai. Other, another explanation is it may be a chronological statement. Moses received the Torah from Sinai means from Sinai onwards. Anything we know from before Sinai is only considered to be significant because we are told about it in the Torah. And Maimonides points, points this out. He says that, that actually, Bris Miller, circumcision, we don't do circumcision because Abraham did it. We do circumcision because we are commanded in the Torah of Moses at Sinai to do circumcision. We do it in the same way as Abraham did it. And we've, but we don't do it because Abraham did it. We, in other words, the Torah is not merely an, it's not ancestor worship. It's not, we don't do things because our ancestors did it. We did it because we were commanded to do so by God at Mount Sinai. So Moses received the Torah from Sinai as a chronological statement. So that's what it says. He received the Torah from Sinai and he gave it to Joshua. Here, another question which we have to ask is that there's an inconsistency in the verbs and in the way it's phrased. Have a look at it carefully. Moses received the Torah from Sinai and he gave it over to Joshua, Joshua to the elders, the elders of the prophets. Now, what it should have, to be consistent, what it should have said is this. Moses received the Torah from Sinai. Joshua received it from Moses. The elders received it from Joshua. Or it should have said, God handed the Torah to Moses. Moses gave it to Joshua and so on and so forth. But you've got Moses receiving and handing it over to Joshua. What's the difference? Many explanations. I'll give you one. One explanation is this. Moses received it because only Moses was a pure receiver. There was no static, there was no ego, there was no subjectivity. Moses was 100% crystal pure reception of Torah. And the word kibel means imply, like a vessel, a utensil, in which you pour something in, you could say kibel, it received. Because a utensil has no, there's nothing of its own involved. It's just poured into. Moses, when he received the Torah at Sinai, there was a level of transmission process which is unprecedented and, and, and never followed either. It never was repeated. Because his tra the transition by God to Moses was such a pure level, there was none of Moses involved. However, subsequent to that, whenever anyone gives over anything, when I say something to you, when you say something to someone else, they're listening, it's always there, there's a little bit of ego and a little bit of subjectivity involved, so it's never a pure transmission process. It, and the word kibel implies an absolute, complete purity of reception. The word limsor, to hand over, which is the second word used in the Mishnah, Moses to Joshua, etc., that implies that one, the, the, the other person is involved a little bit as well. Now, that's not a flaw. That's not a problem because that's part of the plan. God wants us to be involved in the Torah. He wants it to be individual. Now, as I say, He wants that when it's given over, each person, a little bit of themselves is involved. The Torah becomes part of them. They become part of the Torah. That's part of the plan. And there are checks and balances to ensure that it doesn't go to an extreme level. And we have votes, and we have a Sanhedrin, and we have a court. The one exception to that rule was when Moses received it, because he did kibel, pure reception. Okay, he gave it up to Joshua, Joshua for men of the great assembly, and they said three things. Clearly, there's 120 rabbis, amongst them a number of prophets, they said more than three things. But these are three selections of what they said. Have a matunim bedin. Be slow to come to judgment. This is directed towards a leader, a judge, a rabbi. Don't make hasty decisions. You see, the reason they're saying this is because they lived at a time when there was a transition away from prophecy. So instead of prophecy, we had to rely on our brains and our intellect. So they're giving us a couple of ideas here. Number one, if you have to rely on your intellect, you, just don't, get, you don't get a message from God, then you've got to be slow to come to judgment. Look at all the details. Look at the person that you are answering. Try and take everything into account. Holistic halacha, that is to say that your, your ruling should be taking into account everything you can possibly think of. Come slow to judgment. Don't be quick. Amidu Tamidu Harabe set up a lot of students. Again, you see, when you have a lot of students and you have to explain things to them, and you have to answer their questions, it clarifies things to you much, much better. So I know that when I prepare something for teaching, I prepare it, I, I, it's, it's, it's very different than if I just prepare it for my own benefit. Because you see, 
when I prepare for teaching, I have to be much clearer about it. I have to know how to articulate it. I have to be prepared to answer questions. So therefore, it gives me a much greater, and the more students I have, the greater the range of questions there will be, and the greater the range of intellect there'll be, and the, the, the clearer I have to be. So set up many students, and make a fence, meaning, and take precautions anyway. That even if I have thought about it at length, even if I have a lot of students, I've discussed it at length, but I always have to take into account the possibility that I've made a mistake. So therefore, they said we always have to make a little bit of a fence. That means take precautionary measures. So even if I've made a mistake, I won't be trampling on the thing itself. I'll just be hitting the fence, etc. So that's a little bit of an introduction. That's the, uh, the first mission ethics of the fathers. Of course, some also say that the three categories here, be slow to come to judgment, set up lots of students, and make a fence around the Torah, represent also... Um, uh, be slow to come to judgment is, represents thought. Set up many students represents speech. And make fences around the Torah, take precautions, that represents action. That is to say that in every area you always have to consider three things. You have to consider thought, speech, and action. And therefore, that's the advice that they are giving. Slow to judgment. Set up many students. Just one more point. I can't resist this one. It's very important. Ha'amidu Tamidim Harabe set up many students. It doesn't say teach many students. The word used in Hebrew, I don't know if I've conveyed it in the English, I've said set up many students. In the Hebrew, it says Ha'amidu, cause them to stand. Why doesn't it just use the simple Hebrew term teach many students? And I think one of the beautiful answers here is given by Reb Chaim of Velozhin. He says is cause to stand is what it says here. Because you see, if I teach people in such a way they're always going to be dependent upon me, that's not the ideal. I've got to cause them to stand, set them up, make sure they'll be able to stand on their own two feet. Ideally, for a teacher, I would like to be obsolete. I would like to have a situation, this is not Shalom TV management, this is, don't, don't listen to this, right? My ideal is that I want my students to be able to study themselves, not to need me. I want them to be able to stand on their own two feet and understand things themselves. I want to ideally give them the tools in which they can analyze and understand things themselves. Obviously, in, 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 a, in a half an hour segment on cable TV, I cannot do that. But again, when I have a student, that's the ideal. Every, every teacher should really work what they want to do. Set up many students. It doesn't mean to teach them. It means to make sure that they can stand on their own two feet and be able to uh, be independent. And make a fence around the Torah. Right, make a fence around the Torah, and uh, the Abar Brunel says what it means is that when you say words of Torah, keep it short, put a fence around it, so it doesn't go on too long and drive people crazy. Thank you very much for listening. This has been Shalom TV, Dimensions of the Duff. I am Rabbi Mordechai Becher. Um, you want to see where I'm speaking in other places and attend our seminars and lectures, gatewaysonline.com. Um, and if you want to buy my book, Gateway to Judaism, uh, Barnes & Noble, Amazon, Jewish bookstores, etc. Thank you very much for watching. Hopefully we'll see you next time. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who can send a tax-deductible contribution of $36 or more to the nonprofit organization Jewish Education in Media to help support our programming. Tax-deductible checks may be made out to GEM and mailed to GEM, Post Office Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And we thank you for your kind support.